We need to get back. It seems we're under attack again. Are you prepared for the children of the worm? Who are they and what clues have their mysterious cult been leaving us? Back for Blood has a ton of story baked into every mission, environment, and character, but its fast-paced, repeatable gameplay make many details easy to miss. These details contain clues about what's in store for Back for Blood's future and how you can best prepare for new missions. Hi everyone, I'm Darkstar HC, and with Back for Blood's second expansion, Children of the Worm, about to be released, now is the perfect time to take a look at the entire story of Back for Blood, how we got here, and where we're headed. Without wasting any time, we'll start with an expedition in the Arctic Circle, when scientists uncover what they believe to be a nematode species preserved 2,500 feet below the surface of a crater found on a glacial formation. This specimen is transported to Quebec City and is identified as, not a nematode, but a previously undiscovered species named the devil worm for its forked tail and mandibles that resemble horns. A scientist hydrates it in a petri dish which immediately reanimates it. It attacks the scientist, buries itself inside him, and quickly multiplies. This scientist is the first to be infected by the devil worm, succumbing to the ridden disease. Initial symptoms include headaches, confusion, skin discoloration, enlarged veins, convulsions, and violent behavior. These symptoms will progress until the patient is functionally dead and animated solely by the parasitic worms inside of them. At this stage, the patient is known as ridden, technically not a zombie because the worms themselves are alive. He will act primarily on instinct to kill and feed on living tissue. The devil worms begin jumping to new hosts at an epidemic rate. The infection spreads south into the northeastern United States and from there makes it to the setting of our story, the city of Evansburg, Pennsylvania. Evansburg has a population of 2.5 million and in a matter of months that population is decimated. The CDR, or Contagious Disease Response, is deployed in Evansburg to fight the infection. They set up a facility in the parking lot of the Evansburg Fairgrounds and invite infected individuals to come donate specimen samples and receive experimental treatment. Scientists and researchers set up a laboratory on site to begin developing a cure and a vaccine. Among the lead scientists on site is Dr. Rogers, who executes an initiative to capture an experiment on ridden subjects. Eventually, because Evansburg's funeral homes and morgues are overrun, Dr. Rogers signs off on a plan to establish a mass grave behind the CDR's field laboratory in order to isolate the infection and curtail the spread of ancillary diseases. This mass grave becomes known as the body dump, and although its official justifications seem legitimate, its proximity to the lab and the nature of Dr. Rogers' test subjects may suggest he was more concerned with the possibilities of his mad science rather than public health. Eventually, the infection at the CDR gets out of hand. The facility gets further militarized and holding areas for patients turn into cages for rabid monsters. In the end, anyone left at the facility, patient or worker, is presumed dead. The infection continues across the country and eventually the world, wiping out most of the Earth's population. This event is known as the Collapse. Evansburg is engulfed in chaos, but one man emerges, General John Phillips, an experienced war veteran with loyal soldiers at his command. Phillips partners with the Keystone Salvage Consortium, or KSC, who provide weapons and supplies that enable him and his soldiers to secure a base. They take over the historic Fort Evans military base and rename it to Fort Hope to make it a beacon for humanity in the war he's now declaring against the Ridden. And while his newly armed soldiers are a great security force to defend his new home, they're not enough to extend his border and move offensively against the enemy. To do that, he'll need to find a special group of fighters, ones who are immune to the ridden infection. There are a rare few who have found out the hard way that the worm won't bite them. And if these individuals are willing to fight, then they can find a career for themselves in the apocalypse as cleaners. These sought-after individuals can get up close and personal with the Ridden, and they specialize in clearing out Ridden-infested territories, often working in small special operations teams. Their marketable skill sets give them the freedom to take jobs as desired and orders from no one, with loyalty only to their payouts. This means Phillips doesn't always trust them, preferring the loyalty of his soldiers. Nevertheless, his stronghold and abundance of supplies attracts cleaners to his cause, who begin using Fort Hope as a base of operations and work exclusively for him. 
Phillips and the cleaners are able to clear out and secure the surrounding area, re-establishing the town of Finleyville in North Evansburg. A number of buildings are converted into outposts for defense and trade, and Phillips assigns commanders loyal to him to run these outposts, all with Fort Hope as their military and economic center. The next known settlement is Bridgetown, and anywhere outside of Finleyville or Bridgetown is known as the Wild. Most notable among General Phillips' commanders is Wren, who was assigned to the only outpost south of the Kanoa River and oversees all such territory. About six months after the collapse, Wren finds Dr. Rogers in the wild, who somehow escaped the CDR center and has been surviving ever since. Wren brings Rogers to Phillips, and after discussing Rogers' research, Phillips and Rogers decide that his research's focus should be shifted from curing the infection to developing a weapon against it. Phillips offers to provide Dr. Rogers with everything he needs to continue his work. However, he will be hidden and kept secret, since Phillips is fearful for their safety if other settlements discovered the man who could cure the ridden infection. Wren doubts the plan, beginning the rift between him and Phillips, but he agrees to keep the secret in the interest of maintaining peace. Over the following six months, Finleyville is firmly established as a secure settlement. Roughly a dozen cleaners are working for Fort Hope, and Hope is on the brink of wiping out the ridden and winning the war, even without help from Dr. Rogers. The only thing keeping Phillips on edge are scattered reports of strange ridden mutations and unexpected hordes appearing, but he dismisses these stories as paranoia to avoid spreading panic. But everything changes during a routine mission when cleaners are sent to exchange supplies with Wren at his outpost. Wren declares he will no longer follow Phillips, stating that the war is over and Phillips only knows how to lead when there's a war to fight. The point is useless, however, as in those moments, the outpost is unexpectedly overrun with hordes of ridden like they've never seen before. Wren is quickly killed, and the cleaner team consisting of Elijah Walker, Christine, Mom, Tuttle, Holly Forrester, and Evangelo are called back to Fort Hope. The four battle through nightmarish ridden mutations with extraordinary abilities until they eventually have to call in aid at the George Washington Bridge when seeming endless numbers of ridden swarm to their location. Phillips sends a military caravan commanded by Coach as backup and orders the cleaners to blow the bridge to cut off the invading ridden, also cutting off Fort Hope from anything south of the Kanoa River. Upon returning to Fort Hope, the reason for the cleaners' hasty summons is evident. There's a full-scale ridden attack on their home base. Four more of Fort Hope's cleaners, Sue, known as Doc, Howard Robert Hoffman, Jim Hostler, and Carly Fincher are already caught in the action. When Walker, Mom, Holly, and Evangelo return with their convoy, the United Front secures Fort Hope and puts an end to the ridden onslaught, at least temporarily. However, Finleyville is now on its heels. Survivors across the town are barricaded in their outposts, with many injured and in need of help. Fort Hope regroups and the cleaners prepare to rid Finleyville of the remaining ridden. After securing the nearby outposts, the library, and the apartment building, Phillips' next priority is the diner. Unfortunately, it's reported that most soldiers there are injured and can't fight, including some cleaners which are now out of commission, leaving Phillips with just eight cleaners left to fight. It's obvious that the diner is where the front against the ridden is concentrated. Needing to ensure Fort Hope isn't vulnerable to another attack, Phillips assigns Coach to remain at Fort Hope and oversee its defenses. He dispatches cleaners to collect supplies from unsecured locations in Finleyville and take them to the diner, leaving just one of his less experienced commanders, Pelissaro, to lead a mission past the diner and investigate the source of the new ridden threat. After resupplying and securing the diner, Phillips informs his cleaners that he's lost contact with Pelissaro while Pelissaro was investigating the nearby Blue Dog Mine. Convinced this has to be the source of the ridden attacks, Phillips assigns the cleaners to investigate the mine and seal it off if necessary. After criticizing Phillips for not trusting them enough to send them to the mine in the first place, the cleaners continue to the mine where it's obvious that Pelissaro perished. They fight back swarms of superpowered ridden until they seal off all of the mine's entrances. Now, with the source of the ridden cut off and Finleyville on the mend, the cleaners return to Fort Hope, hoping that the end of the war is once again within reach. General Phillips wants to retrieve additional weapons to secure Finleyville and continue to clear the ridden out of the greater Evansburg area. Roaming independent factions, notably the Liberators, Bower Hill MC, Calypso, and the familiar KSC, are now looking for new trading opportunities in the face of difficult circumstances, and Phillips wants to maintain Fort Hope's position as the center of Evansburg's economy. 
He sends cleaners to the Finleyville police station to gather weapons and supplies, but when the cleaners arrive, they're met with a grave sight. The station is decimated and brimming with ridden guarding fresh nests. It's the first sign that the war isn't over. It's just beginning. There are no supplies left to get, and they track the ridden again to an underground source, this time the sewers. Not wanting to return empty-handed, the cleaners make their way through the sewers and fight their way to a recent shipwreck. They call Phillips to airlift supplies off the shipwreck and find that the hundreds of bodies left at the wreck prove to have been the perfect food for the devil worm and its many mutations. Mutations are created by incorporating the tissues of multiple people or animals, and there's plenty of material here to use. Narrowly escaping these mutated hordes, the cleaners fly off with the supplies back to Fort Hope. There seems to be little chance of victory in this war. The ridden are too many and too relentless. But as if right on cue, Dr. Rogers, the possibly mad scientist Phillips has been hiding away for over half a year, contacts Phillips to tell him that he's made a breakthrough. Phillips is plagued with guilt that he didn't heed the warnings and act sooner against the new ridden threat. So he jumps on the opportunity to take it out and end the war. He informs his cleaners about Dr. Rogers, causing further mistrust about his secrets, and gives them the mission to retrieve the scientist. The cleaners are to go see Smithy, who commands the outpost at the church, who will give them further instructions. The cleaners learn that Smithy took Dr. Rogers to the Finley estate against his reservations, that it's in a secluded forest surrounded by Ridden, but Rogers was enthusiastic about the opportunity to have Ridden close by for his research. Smithy left Rogers with his truck and rigged the surrounding forest with fire traps, and the cleaners found that the Ridden were happy to spring those traps. Once at the estate, Phillips tells the cleaners to observe Rogers' test, and extract him if necessary. They find Rogers and he launches canisters of a chemical he's designated the T5 formula off into the distance where he believes the ridden are most concentrated. At first it seems to work clearly hurting them. However, it's not as effective as he hoped and there are far more ridden in the area than Rogers planned for. Huge hordes descend upon the Finley estate as the cleaners rush to collect Rogers research materials and move him to a safe location. General Phillips provides the church outpost as the new secret laboratory for Dr. Rogers. Rogers insists that the T5 formula itself is not the problem. The problem is how it's delivered. He says that cleaners armed with personal weaponized canisters of the formula will be able to accurately dose the ridden and take them out with ease. But in order for more T5 formula to be produced, he needs to restock his chemical reserves from the CDR center in the Evansburg fairgrounds. So. All eight cleaners dispatch to secure the laboratory in the CDR facility, and Rogers joins them in a helicopter above to instruct them on synthesizing the formula using the equipment and materials already prepared in the lab. He picks up a large batch of T5 in the helicopter and leaves enough behind for the cleaners to execute another test right there at the body dump, the mass grave behind the facility. And this grave is exactly what the cleaners have been looking for all along at least tens of thousands of bodies piled up to play host to the worms and feed the mutation amalgams. Giant nests have emerged below and there are mutations as far as the eye can see. This is where they're coming from. This is the source of the new ridden attacks. This is where the cleaners end the war. The T5 works. Ridden that come into contact with it are instantly shredded by bullets. But the cleaners still have a fight. They descend into the hellish pit, rain down T5 on anything that moves, and unleash everything they've got into the nests. Not only do chilling numbers of ridden rush them at every angle, but giant ogres emerge from beneath their feet to defend their home. But the cleaners never back down, and they get the job done. Dr. Rogers picks them up in the helicopter to take them to Fort Hope for what should be a victory celebration, but the sentiment is quickly betrayed by a haunting message Rogers has just received from Hope. Bloody bruised and beaten, the eight cleaners are taken back to their home to find it under the heaviest onslaught of ridden it's ever faced. Phillips is fighting on the front lines alongside his soldiers in the streets of Finleyville. The eight are preparing to land when they see it. The answer to their transgressions. A hive is as strong as its queen, and a mother defends her nest. The cleaner's latest attack has unearthed the ultimate amalgam of the hive a Godzilla-sized ridden monster on a path for revenge. With few options left, the cleaners perform an act of desperation and fly directly over the monster, known as the Abomination, to go with its mouth open and drop their entire supply of T5 inside. 
The plan works and the monster retreats underground, but the helicopter is quickly shot down by an ogre projectile. The helicopter spirals downward, crashing into the streets. Luckily, everyone survives. Well, everyone except Dr. Rogers. With no time to mourn, the cleaners split up to find Phillips and chase down the abomination. The monster burrows beneath the streets and chasing it, the cleaners are terrified to see that it has already created massive underground tunnels lined with nesting material of tissue and worm resin. Some of the cleaners find Phillips and report that he's in bad shape, while the others catch up to the weakened abomination and finish it off. The eight cleaners then regroup on the surface, having defeated the threat and successfully defended Fort Hope. The war is over. The cleaners destroyed the source of the Ridden and killed the Hive Queen. They breathe a sigh of relief and make future plans for spreading out and making sure no more abominations exist. After all his secrets and lies, it seems the cleaners are less concerned about what Phillips might want them to do, especially since they leave him injured on the battlefield to go get breakfast. They do, however, keep Fort Hope as their home for the time being, and it's at Fort Hope that the next major development happens before anyone's had nearly enough time to enjoy their victory. A mysterious woman in a firefighter's uniform, who goes by Charisse, shows up at Fort Hope. She has some disturbing stories about the Ridden in the wild, and no one wants to dismiss legitimate Ridden threats again. Charisse tells the cleaners about how her and her former firehouse crew have been fighting off the Ridden on their own since the collapse. They had been doing all right, even against evolving mutations, but things started to change once the tunnels started opening. She describes pits of Ridden nest material breaking up through the ground, revealing caverns below. These openings connect terrifying tunnels filled with nests and structures never seen on the surface. They tried exploring these tunnels but encountered brand new mutations that quickly outnumbered them. Charisse was the only one to make it out alive. Determined to investigate this issue, the cleaners, now joined by Charisse, venture out into Evansburg set on exploring these new ridden anomalies. Also joining them is veteran cleaner Hang, newly recovered from the attack on the diner. They find a tunnel opening soon enough, and upon entering, discover that their worst nightmares have come true. Humanity may never rest, and the Ridden may never leave, because it seems like every time the cleaners think they've won, the Ridden come back even stronger. The Ridden haven't been exterminated, they've simply been biding their time, boring out the carcass of the very earth itself to spread their disease. These are more than tunnels and more than nests. They're fully formed hives of cavernous proportions that could stretch for miles. No wonder the Ridden have always come from underground. This is their home turf. Resin and nest material in unimaginable amounts line every corner of these hives, and everywhere you look you can see the remnants of tens if not hundreds of thousands of dead bodies which have been amalgamated into the walls. Incubation pods hang from the ceiling, spitting out Ridden when a horde is called. In fact, the whole place feels like one big hive mind, as if you're walking inside the belly of a beast already. Attack the pods and the caverns cry out. Attack a nest and ridden come crawling out of every surface you can see. And if you're brave enough to venture into an inner lair, you'll find yourself in what seems to be a mutation nursery. At the center of the nursery is a large, indestructible nest that almost resembles a brain or a heart. Surrounding it is a number of large chambers sealed by nest material. If any are broken open, Anything can be waiting on the other side, from a dozen tall boy mutations to a giant ogre. Many new questions are on everyone's mind. What are these incubation pods and are they producing common ridden? What function does the inner layer nest serve? How integrated is the hive mind and is it shared between hives? As horrifying as these hives are to observe, they may begin to offer some answers which can help us gain new weapons against the ridden. Especially important since the helicopter crash killed Dr. Rogers and the abomination attack seems to have destroyed his research, which means no more T5 formula. But the greatest mysteries unearthed within the Ridden Hives involve evidence of intelligent life living among the worms. Delicately displayed in prominent locations, the cleaners find finely crafted totems of human remains. These skull totems seem to have been made by humans from humans, enter in even the deepest parts of the hives, including the inner layer nurseries. In fact, there is always one enshrined beneath the inner layer nest with a horde of scavenged goods nearby, as if as an offering. Weapons and supplies can actually be found throughout the hives, including special crates decorated with white paint and primal symbols. 
These special crates are rigged with biological booby traps, but contain extremely rare items the cleaners haven't seen anywhere else. Even more mysterious, upon returning to Fort Hope, the cleaners find dark, disturbing figures calling themselves the Collectors, claiming they want to trade. They're not interested in any supplies, however. They simply want the skull totems the cleaners have been taking out of the hives. There's a lot we don't know, but I would say it's a safe bet that it's the children of the worm who have been making the skull totems and painted or warped chests. Now, we still don't know if children of the worm is an official faction title or derogatory nickname. We assume this is what they look like. Given their glowing eyes they share with known infected ridden, it's reasonable to assume they're also infected. Perhaps they're a subset of humans with some pre-existing condition which allows the worms to live inside them with a mutualistic rather than a parasitic relationship. We know that the devil worm disease is dependent on host conditions. That's why stinger variants, for instance, are always female. Maybe the children were once common ridden but mutated into this form. It's also worth considering if they are the mysterious collectors come to reclaim their totems, and if not, what the collector's relationship with them might be. It's clear they've set up some religious ideology, and the new expansion, they will be known as cultists, who are described as seeking paradise. If this is a side effect that the hive mind can have on the human mind, it's scary to think how dangerous the Ridden's influence can be. So that's it. The entire story of Back for Blood from start to finish so far. The fate of the cleaners, Fort Hope, and the world still very much hangs in the balance. I hope you enjoyed this deep dive into the game's lore and please let me know in the comments what you're looking forward to learning about the most. If you learned something new, a like on the video would be appreciated. And make sure to join me live at the launch of Children of the Worm on Twitch so we can all explore the answers to these mysteries together. Thanks everyone, stay tuned and subscribe for more videos, lots of ridden, love, and gaming.